Welcome back to that rugby podcast hosted by the Rugby Booth. I am Luke. That is Husey. Uh, we are back for another week. We missed last week just due to me holidaying and being about on the world. Um, but we're back just before we kind of get into the thick of the Northern Tour. We are three weekends out, I believe, three weekends out from the first games kicking off, which for me is a Japan game for you is an England game, but we follow up your England game, I believe, or you follow up our England game. I can't quite remember how the schedule works out. Um, but there's a lot of rugby up and coming. Obviously, Northern Hemisphere yes. rugby is underway. Southern Hemisphere uh, rugby um, is starting to get club rugby underway. When we say club rugby, our franchise rugby, our super rugby. Some teams have been photographed training. One player, notably, who had made the jump from Rugby League to Rugby Union in a Waratah's jersey has come out, Joseph Sawali. So that's awesome to see. Um, but, I cannot yeah. tell you how, I won't say what it made me in, in truth, but how excited that made me to see him in the Waratah's jersey. Oof, oof, looking, <laughs> looking, oof, looking very good in a Waratah's blue. Yeah, a bit of a different blue to the Roosters blue. But first, I wanted to mention something. Obviously, on our last podcast, we were a little bit sarcastic with the Springboks and their win of the Rugby Championship, although thoroughly deserved. We didn't take that away from them. But I just kind of wanted to do a bit of a deep dive into, and this wasn't this wasn't aimed at the Springboks fans because I don't think a lot of them are saying this is the greatest ever all time. But I just wanted to see where the Springboks team related in terms of that All Blacks of the 2011 to 2016 team. So I quickly ran some stats um, just to make sure I wasn't so far off that I still think the 2015 or the 2011, 2015 All Blacks, that branch was the greatest of all time All Blacks mm-hmm. team. And, and the, re- the reason I still believe that, and I think I'm going to sway a few people, is the fact that this is this is the data that was pulled. So the Springboks from 2019, from the first game in 2019 to their pre Northern Tour, the Autumn Series in 2024, have played 61 games, have won 45 of them, lost 15, drawn one, for a win percentage of 73.77%, and two World Cups in there, and a British and Irish Lions Series. Those you can't take away, obviously. Massive wins, um, massive um, achievements, 73.77% is a fantastic win percentage for any team on a global stage. The All Blacks, 2011, to their 2016 pre-Northern Tour. So I did it all the way up until they went on to that Northern Tour. Um, 76 played, 69-1, 5 lost, 2 drawn for a 90.79. So pretty much a 91 versus a 74% ratio we're looking at. Two World Cups, obviously no um, British and Irish Lions series during that time because in 2013 it was in Australia. 2017 we hosted the British and Irish Lions. So... You're looking at two very different teams here. Now, I think what I'm seeing and what I'm understanding here is I think the competitive balance of rugby has shifted between 2011 and 2016. And what I mean by that is I think if you look at rugby now than when you look back then, there are more teams at the top. And I say that we look Mm -hmm. at it. I know Australia may be one of those teams that have fallen, but even fallen isn't a right way I would pitch that. I would say that... At, at this point right now, South Africa, you know, you've got your islands, you've got England's not far off from top shelf. You've got yeah. your All Blacks, your French, your um, your, your Wallabies still can win I was going to say the Northern well. Hemisphere has has risen. The Northern Hemisphere, like, I would say that in Southern Hemisphere rugby has improved. Maybe not Australia, but New Zealand and South Africa and Argentina have all improved, I think. Like, in terms of just the technical ability, how the game is played, how they've understood the game. That's natural. Every, every team should be, every team is, is constantly um, improving. It's just how they, how fast they improve alongside others. Right. Like there's, there, you know, just because that's how sports science works. That's just because that's how, you know, game theory and strategy works. Teams are constantly getting better. Athletes are constantly getting more athletic. People are, people are uh, better athletes than they were, now than they were a decade ago. Like, that's that's in every sport. This is the same in every sport. This is not exclusive to rugby. What I think, though, is that the Northern Hemisphere teams, their rate of improvement has been higher than that of the Southern Hemisphere. But that's because they also had a lower point to start from, if that makes sense. So I think, you know, you look at the improvement Irish rugby has made, um, which has been a long-term strategy 
for them. And where did they where did they adapt that from? They adapted it from New Zealand's high performance um, program. Uh, so I think, and and you know, the South Africa I think has really really improved quite a lot, and is probably the nation that has the science of rugby down the best, right? Um, and and yet they don't have the same winning percentage as the All Blacks from that golden era. And the, the reason is, is as you said, it's the competition. And it's not as if these teams have just suddenly come out of nowhere. They've been improving this, this whole time. They've just been improving at a faster rate than, the, than their Southern Hemisphere counterparts. I mean, you know, look, when you're at the pinnacle of the game, like the All Blacks and Springboks are, there's only so much growth you could do. At that point, you're, you're pushing the envelope. You're at the cutting edge. You're developing new stuff and there's only so fast you can go with that within the laws of rugby the the northern hemisphere teams they were in a lot of cases copying the pattern of successive you know an all blacks or springboks system or you know sort of developing their own internal competition and building that up france for example and 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 boosting rugby that way um so yeah look i think that you're 100 percent spot on it's the 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 rugby landscape at the top level is is probably more competitive than it's ever been. Yeah, yeah. And that, I definitely wanted to highlight that. But then I also wanted to highlight the next set that I pulled because I kind of thought, well, okay, so what, what, what does a South African team have to do to be the greatest of all time? And I actually think that these are the years that they could potentially put themselves down as, as the greatest of all time and not what we previously saw from 2019. So the reason I say that, the All Blacks from 2016 to the post-Northern Tour right now in 2024. So we've got eight years. We've got 97 games. They've won 73, lost 21, drew three. So they sit at a 75.26%. So let's round that down. 75% versus the Springbok 74%. And, you know, an eight-year span. So you'd sit there and you go, obviously, nothing. No World Cups won. Um, a Lion Series drawn. So no major trophies or tournaments won. Obviously, they won the Bleeder Slow every year and so on and so forth. But we're still sitting at a higher percentage than them at. So we can't take this as a win percentage thing to put this as Springbox team as a GOAT team. But we can yeah. if. And the reason I say a big if, if from this 2014 to 2027, they do what the All Blacks did, which is 90%. And if you think this year, I believe, or you know, since that World Cup, if we take it from 2023, they've lost like two or three games. So they're probably sitting mm-hmm. at a high percentage. I haven't actually broken that down. I would love to. But they are sitting at a high percentage currently. If they can continue that on for the years of dominance that that All Blacks team had, we could see the making of the greatest of all time team. And that's what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. It's going to take – it's not actually that 2019 to 24, 2014. It's what's going to come next with Razzy and the Springboks team and what they can do leading yeah. up to the Springboks series. So that's where I go. I go, okay, cool. The Springboks team will go down as one of the best ever in these 29, 2024. If they want to go down as the greatest of all time, it's not the blokes that have built this team. Like, you know, you'll see a Khaleesi's, you'll do a home, the Malins. It's not them who are the ones that are leading the charge. It's going to be this next group, you know, um, again, same uh, same reference to Hondro Pollard and that old group. Your Jesper Vises, um, your Fassies, your all of those players are going to lead this charge. And if they win another World Cup, sitting at ninety percent, then we can start to bring in discussions that over this period of time, they have been the greatest yeah. of all time team. But that's what I just. And again, it's not an All Blacks fan t- trumping his tooting his own horn. That All Blacks twenty eleven to twenty sixteen was one of the best teams you ever see. Only like undefeated international season in 2013 that I in recent times that I can remember, they were one of the best teams, if not the greatest team, as we're discussing it right now of all time. So it's a hefty thing to live up to. But just looking at it now, I go, okay, this Springboks team, one of the greats, not the greatest, could be the greatest if they continue on the, the trajectory they're going at, and they beat everyone as they do. Even if they sat, say they won this next World Cup, and they sat, we ran these stats again from. 2024 to 2027. Um, my belief is if they're around 80, 85 percent, we're looking at the greatest team of all time, purely because of mm. the the three World Cups in a row, the mo- the momentum they've built, the improvements they've shown. So, look, if I'm looking at now, like now, a lot now, I say the pressure now goes back on to the Springboks again to go and get that greatest all time title and to be that team, um, because I'm. As much as we, we all know World Cups matter, 
they're not going to be na- noted as a greatest of all time team if they cannot continuously win games. And yes, that yeah. Ireland series was a little drop off again, lost one game. They'll be disappointed in that. Um, to lose one game against Argentina will be disappointed in that. Those all take effect. But if you want to put yourself down as the greatest of all time, you need to continuously win games throughout a World Cup cycle and not just win World Cup cycles. So that's my that's yep. my post on that, my theory on that. Yeah, it's, you know, and it sounds harsh, but I mean, this is when we're talking about greatest of all time. That's it's, It is historic. You have to be historic. You can't just be good. You can't just be great. You have to be the greatest. You know, so yeah, the, the it is it is hard. I know we could say this, you know, and people could say all they want. Oh, you guys are just Wallabies, All Blacks fans. You know, you're you're being unnecessarily harsh on the Springboks. You know, it, 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 we we give Springboks and Springbok fans shit. We give each other shit. That's just the nature of we give Lost Pubas fan shit. Although we don't really get many of them in our podcast because we don't speak Spanish, but. Um, <laughs> You know, we that's just the nature of our rugby rivalries. But at the end of the day, we're all rugby fans and we want to see great historic rugby. Um, you know, it's unfortunate when it comes at the expense of our teams. But, and, and as obviously biased as we're going to be when we're predicting games and stuff, you know, the Wallabies, obviously, and things like that. That doesn't, that's not a uh, reflection, I guess, on like, that. that's not what we, we, we truly, like, when we, sort of talk it a bit straighter like this is what we really think i hope people pick that up like when we when we're being serious versus when we're being sarcastic because i i i would hope that we're making it clear but yeah look there's this is look they've got they've they've got the skills they've got the players to do it you know it's it's up to the rest of the world to stop the spring mocks from from carving their legacy as the greatest team of all time um and you know there's a high standard to live up to so uh but hey, look, if there's a man to do it, it's Razzie, you know? Totally. Get in your head. <laughs> um, let's get on to, obviously, the Northern Tour. Now, an interesting fact that I read, and I don't know, I haven't looked up if this is true, but apparently if the Springboks win their three games on tour, which is England, Wales, Scotland, um, they will go to number one no matter what Ireland does in their series mm. um, because of the away games and the format and how... That, w- that affects world rankings. So South Africa could go number one side, but we're not talking about South Africa today. We are talking about our teams. You, let's start with your Wallabies. They have England, Wales, Scotland, Ireland as their four games yep. in that order. Um, what are you expecting? What are you hoping for? What's a success? What's a failure for you and your Wallabies on this Norman tour? I think a success is three wins. I think a failure is one win, and it's a push if it's 2-2. Two, two. Because, look, England... So they should beat Wales. We've already beaten Wales twice this year, right? So, you know, should should make it three for three, right? England, Scotland, and Ireland, those are all going to be tough games, especially playing in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, what I want to see, I want to see Tane Edmed get his shot to put his stamp on the 10 jersey, right? Noah's had a shot. He hasn't put his stamp on it, right? And that's like, but he's, he's, he's done okay. He hasn't done enough to own that jersey. I think you've got to give Tane Edmed a shot to make that jersey his own. And if he doesn't do it, we continue the competition until we find out someone who does put a stamp on it, right? Edmed has been fantastic in the NPC. He has been developing nicely. He's put in, he's been putting in the hard work. Same as Noah has. And I, again, I don't want to take anything away from Noah Lawless here. He's been in an in a, in a competition two orders of magnitude, if not more, more difficult than the one Edmed's been in. Right to play, be playing the rugby championship teams as we keep saying three of the four semi-finals from last World Cup is is much different than playing, you know, uh, w- the NPC teams. It's just it, it, it just is, you know. Uh, but Edmed in those games has put has shown he's a class above those players, which is great. That's what you want to. That's what you sh- you would expect to see from an international level player. So I want to see Edmed in there as the Wallabies ten. Um, you know, I want to see, you know, Skeletons coming back. I want to see how he fits into the side, if at all. Um, you know, they're taking a lot of players in these tour tours. Um, what I would say, the thing I'm most excited to see is, I think, and it's probably no surprise, is the Wallaby shiny new toy, Joseph Suali. Where does he fit in into the Wallaby system? Is he a fullback? Is he a wing? Is he a center? Like, where, where does Schmidt think his true strength lies? I'd love to see him at inside center. You know, I think he's a hard ball carrier, can make good contact and can make some plays out of that inside center position, which everyone knows 
I think Harden Plastam is a good player. I don't think he's the Wallabies answer at twelve. I just don't. Um, and there's nothing against the bloke. I think he's a great bloke. It's just that's just my opinion on the matter. I'd love to see Suwali East slot in there. Um, I'd love to see, you know, I'd love to see a bit of a youth movement for the Wallabies in the backs. I'd like to see Jorgensen get some regular playing time, either at fullback or on the wing. Um, and let Lenny Kitao, Lenny Kitao should retain a 13th spot. I just like, to, I, I'm excited to see what Schmidt does with the back line. Like, wh- how does it all uh, figure out? How does it all come together? Um, Dylan, Do you think- I'd love to see him. As well, do you see some consistency really? throughout the four games, or do you think he tries combos throughout the four games? Like, would you rather well, see? That's a very... I guess results dependent, isn't it? I, I, it's a, it's a great question. I, I honestly don't know. I think what we saw from him in this rugby championship, he didn't change too much. He made some changes, but not too many. I would say it would be a relatively consistent side with maybe one or two changes each game. You know what I mean? Like he'll keep the a lot of the plays that he might do a rotation. So he might do say for example, you know, he's between game one and game two might change a winger. Then between game two and game three, you know, swap the winger back but then move in a different center or something like that. Um I think we'll see probably relative consistency but with a couple of swaps here and there just to test out maybe an individual piece or two rather than wholesale changes like i wouldn't expect to see two totally different back lines between the different games yeah interesting and so yeah so two wins you're kind of questionable depending on who those two wins are and then it depends on the nature of the wins and the losses as well you know like it's you know we could we could say you know as much as we might say look oh yeah four wins is 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 what it will be. You know, you could have uh, four wins where you barely scrape guy and you get him off a lucky referee call that goes your way. You know, I'd rather have three wins of good consistency and a close loss than four wins that we don't deserve to win because it's more, you know, the tours are nice and all, but the results don't go towards anything. They don't count. They're not a competition, right? You know, as, as much as we have, you know, made fun of the rugby championship in our recent podcast, you know, there you want all wins because you you know you you want to win you want to win the competition you want to beat the Springboks you want to beat Argentina you want to beat All Blacks things like that but you know with these Northern tours it is about the growth and development of players more so than it is the results so I'd rather see some really great rugby out of the Wallabies than than X number of wins and X, and Y number of losses you know like if we say you know the last game against Ireland if that's the Wallabies best game of the year and it looks like a squad that can take it to the number one teams in the world and they narrowly miss out. That's better than, I would say, uh, really scrappy and sloppy games from both teams will Wallaby somehow managed to come out on top. And I know that sounds weird and it sounds a bit counterintuitive, but what the Wallabies have been lacking is consistency, right? It's been, you know, being able to string together good performances. So I'd like to see four consistent performances across uh, across the games, you know, with a minimum of turnovers, minimum of penalties, things like that, which they wish they showed in the Bledisloe. Like, there weren't that many penalties in the Bledisloe. Uh, so that, that's what I'd really like to see uh, from the Wallabies. And, um, yeah, so, so that, that's more what I'm looking for than wins and losses, is just the, the actual team performance, is watching the games, seeing how they go. And you know what? I would take... I would take Owen Four if we could f- find a good fly half who's going to be our future fly half for the next five years or so. Who's got, who's put their stamp, puts their stamp in the position and says, "Yep, this is mine. I can lead this team around. I can I can get us uh, wins against the top side." You know, I I w- these wins don't matter. It's more about the performance and the development. I feel like if you get that, you won't be Owen Four um, because exactly. you are. You, I know. you know. You know what I mean. Exactly what I mean because you are a fly half away from. Clinical rugby, some would say, in in the Australian circles. Um, my All Blacks take on Japan, take on England, then Ireland, France, and Italy. So ideally, easy game, easy game to start, easy game to finish with Japan and Italy. Obviously, can't write them out. They have made history before. Two strong teams, but against the All Blacks, um, I believe you have to get wins on the board for either of those teams. Um, whereas we have the big three in the middle: England, then Ireland, then France. Will be really easy. Interesting to see how we attack those games, what squad we select. Um, but saying that we have named our squad, unlike you blokes, um, not a lot of changes um, to the squad that was seen yeah. right the way through the uh, rugby championship. So free hookers are the same, props are all the same, 
Locks pretty much all the same. Um, Lucy's all the same. Only difference is Hoffman is out for Cam Roygaard as Cam Roygaard made his return um, through uh, NPC Rugby for Counties Manukau. Uh So he will be lacing up the boots. First five eights all the same. Midfield's all the same. Outside backs all the same. So um, what we're looking at and the argument and the discussions all leading up to the squad naming was what's going to happen with Sam Kane and TJ Perinara. Our two old heads who have performed diligently in the black jersey, have done their job, obviously moving overseas next year, um, both over to Japan. What is going to happen to them? Are they going to be selected? They have both been selected. Pre the selection and pre Aaron Razor discuss it, I was like, this is an opportunity for the All Blacks to take a chance, to rebuild, to look into the future, to go, you know what, TJ and Kano, you've done a fantastic service for the All Blacks, but your time is over. We don't need you on this tour. Mm. I was all for that. I was like, let's get the young backs in. Let's do it. Let's throw them in the deep end, see if they swim. Let's start the rebuild now. I'm now seeing why he's done this. And the reason I see this is, especially in the halfbacks region, you look at Cam Regard, 23, Kurt Sratima, 23, Noah Hoffman, like 21, TJ Perinara, 32. What Cam Regard and Kurt Sratima have not done is go on a Northern Tour yet. What TJ Perinara has done is a plenty of times is go on a Northern Tour. So I go, what can TJ teach them? Even though he may not be a player, he may not even play on this Northern Tour, TJ Perinara. Yeah. He probably will. But I look at Cam Regard's my first choice halfback in any team I'm selecting other than the world international one with Anton Dupont's name in there. Um, but Cam Regard, I think, is going to be one of the greatest halfbacks be up there with Aaron Smith. I go, Court Stratemar has shown he's capable at a test level. So I think TJ Perinara is there for the experience to see what else we can, what uh, more information we can hey, ooze for out again, of him. Northern Tour game. Exactly. What more can we, information can we ooze out of him? Can we try and pull from him? Can we get from him to Ring help these young bucks, guys? Yeah. <laughs> you look at him and those two, he's 32 now, TJ Perinara. He's these other two, 23, are nine years still in the game. That right now is two World Cups, if we think about it. Um, yeah. So the way we have to be looking at this is if those two are around for the next nine years, then... It's, it's, it's three World Cups. 2015, three World Cups? 2019, 2023, yeah. There you go. 2015, 2025, 2029, 2023, 2030, whatever. Three World Cups, potentially three World Cups. Um, yeah. So what we're looking at is how can we get the information from arguably our second best halfback, all black, ever. Like, what we can't diminish either is TJ Perinara's resume, and that's he sat behind the greatest all black of, uh, halfback of all time, which is Aaron Smith, which is totally fine, and did a bloody good job. With any other team probably other than Goldilocks at Springboks would have started at... Um, would have started in any other team up until now as well with DuPont. So I go, look, give the man his credit. He's done his thing. Same thing with Sam Kane. Sam Kane, 32, obviously has the experience. Not quite the same as the loose forwards um, because they're a little bit older. You look at Ethan Black at a 29, but only 15 games of experience. Sam Apini Finau, 25, four games of experience. Luke Jacobson, 27, 24 games. Dalton Papaliti, 26 with 36. You've obviously got Artie in there as well, but more to do in a loose forward situation. And Wallace Atiti, the new boy of 22, with five games in there. So I go, it's the same thing. Like Sam Kane, 100 games of experience. There is no doubt that you're not trying to ooze as much information for the Northern Tour. For guys like, I don't think even Blackhead has been on one yet. I don't think Finau's definitely not been on one. Satiti's not been on one. So only the only guys that have been on one, I don't even think Jacobson might have gone and not played in any game. So the only guys that have played are Sevilla, Papali and Kane. And I go, as all black fans, we expect wins. We expect 90% win rates. That is what we expect. Mm. Razor also knows this. Razor goes, if I can take a squad that can do a job over there, even if they're not going to be here around for the future, but if they can get me wins now, and if Sam Kane is that guy that gets them a win now, and they can teach some of those younger guys coming through what it's like so that the Luke Jacobsons, the Sam Apini females, can teach that next generation as well, 
why not? So that was my big takeaway from the All Blacks selection. The only other thing I'm really interested in is who's going to start at first five because all the stories are correct. Bowden Barrett, to me, was world player of the year twice as a first five. And we decided silly that we needed to fit, fit Richie Moronga in and won zero World Cups. Now, I, I see the argument because Richie Moronga is a fantastic flyer. Damien McKenzie is yeah. not the same first five that is Richie Moronga. Bowden Barrett is the best player at the world at 10 when he was playing 10. Getting back to 10. So that's, that's my thoughts on that. I'm just going to quickly jump into the All Blacks XV team named as well, which I liked a lot of the selections here. They've selected those guys that are All Blacks previously. So you've got some definitely some older players, you know, George Bowers in there, Marcel Renata, two older props um, above the age of 30. And then you've got the younger blokes, Xavier Numea, 25, George Dyer, 24, Salau, Salau Mai, Mal, uh, 24 from Highlanders as well. Same with the hookers, uh, a bunch of experience, Kurt Eklund. It's, it's, it seems like they've gone to the guys who deserve selections, who've worked hard, have played a lot of Super Rugby, a lot of um, NPC games, and played at a high level. The only name that's missing is Braden Oster, um, and there'll be some questions around that because – Pretty much the whole Hurricanes loose forward trio that's going to be there for the future. Dupal C. Khalifi, Peter Larkai, and OSC could have been in that starting. Hoskins Satutu's in there. You see the return of Noah Hotham and Finlay Christie. Uh, big reps on this Josh Jacum coming through. Um, and just recent news, the Hurricanes lost Brent Cameron to an ACL injury. So he's not going to be playing first five for them anymore. So we're out of first fives. So there is some rumours that Jacum... We could be trying to steal him from the uh, grass with the Chiefs to get him down. Um, another player I'm really excited for, we've got another Naholo in a black jersey, Kenny Kinney, um, playing in the All Blacks XV. So now we'll be able to start um, a song based on him as well. Um, but the outside <laughs> books look dangerous. And Riley Higgins, who luckily enough I've played with, um, is one fantastic rugby player coming through the Hurricanes, 22 years old in the midfield, could really shoot up into that Jersey. So look, it's going to be interesting to see how this team performs. They've got two games, I believe. One's against, um, let me see, actually, I've got it. One's against Munster, and then the other's against Georgia. Um, so mm. two interesting games, you know, obviously a club team. Munster, no slouches yeah. in the URC. Um, one of the couple of years ago, we were in the final last year. Actually, and on that, Munster and Leinster just had a game and sold out Croke Park, or whatever it was, and 80, 80 plus thousand people to a new RC game, which was a new record for that. So, look, I think yeah. that Munster game will get a, a few people talking. I believe it happens the day of the England game. So, it's like you kind of roll into um, New Zealand rugby there. So, lots of big things happening in the All Black squad. Lots of selections happening. Lots of interesting selections going forward at the end of your tour. Obviously, your team hasn't been named yet the Wallaby squad. Um, but as you've said, you, you, you know Will Skelton's come back into the mix. Joseph Sawali's made himself available. Is there any other names you potentially chuck out there? You've chucked out Tane Embed that you'd like to see or do you want to see some more flow of what you've had? Dylan Peach. I think he's... Marika Carbetti has done great service in a Wallaby's jersey. I think he's probably... It's time for him to retire or, or you know just focus on his club level game you know and he deserves the break um i think peach from all wallabies wingers in the international period this year has looked the best to me right more so uh than you know Callaway, more so than dalgunu um you know even my boy wonder max jorgensen when he's been on he's had some explosive plays i think dylan peach has been well consistent and his defense has been Fantastic as well. Great tackles, great contact. Runs very hard and very physically. Um, I want to see more from him. I think he deserves a shot in a Wallabies jersey. I'd love to see Corey Tool chucked out there for a game. Just to see what happens. Just to see what happens at a Wallabies level. Can he replicate his Super Rugby success? Chuck him out there against Wales. What have you got to lose? You know, what What have you got to lose? Uh, just, you know, just give, 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 him, give him a shot. Give him a shot. You know, I think it gets a game like a Scotland where it's going to be a grinded out type of game, which it typically is against the Scottish, not the one to throw him out there for. But Wales, where it might be a bit more free-flowing, or, or Ireland, or even, you know, 
I think that's a, that's a good game to give Corey Tull a shot and see what he he does. You know, I talk a lot about the the backs, um, but uh, you know, I'd like to see as well. Look, I think the forwards from the forwards, I just want to see a consistent forward pack who plays consistently. You know, so the same players who get the, come in and get the job done don't need to be the best in the world, right? Just need to be consistent every game and put out a a good enough performance, right? Um, like, like that's the main thing. It's just getting consistency. Is I think you said this before. It might have been you. Is is narrow, or it might have been something else totally unrelated. But narrowing the gap between their peaks and troughs. You know, like we don't. You know, we don't want to see super super high, super super low, super super high, super super low. No one wants that sine wave. We want straight line, flat line. You know, heart attack, cardiac arrest, straight line. Um, <laughs> I mean, that's not how a heart attack works. It's actually, <laughs> rhythm, but. We want dead. We want you. We want the. We want the the cold, stony efficiency of a dead heart. Just flat line. That's our put. You, you know what you're going to get from them every single game because the, and then you can plan around that. You can base your game plan around that when you know what you're getting every single time. You know, if I play X player at Y position for Z number of minutes, this is what I'm getting out of them. That's what we want. Um, so. Uh, that that's what I really want to see from the four pack is just consistency because they've had some fantastic games this season. They've had some absolute shockers. Interesting, and we'll we'll cover it all as your team does get named. Last bit of rugby that we haven't covered, but the old Johnny Sexton versus Rico Ioane um, mm. buff that's been going on over on the on the line. Um, Johnny Sexton to release a new book. Obviously, is going to try and push out some previews and some yeah. sell ops. It's going to be called and, uh, Sexton in the City. <laughs> and and his his take was that Ricky Oani came up and told him to uh, enjoy the flight at home and enjoy your re- retirement, you old C-word. Um, hey, cunt. Um, and he said, you know, this isn't very All Blacks-like, you know, no dickheads, righty, righty, rah. Let me start off yeah. from an All Blacks point of view. Now, I don't think Ricky, Ricky Oani is a dickhead, but he loves trash talk, and there's no doubt about yeah. it. He's one of the rugby players who loves to do it, who enjoys it, who likes that part of the game, the confrontational part of the game. You've seen him. There's moments against Wales where he's done it. There is just times, even in Super Rugby, you can see he's one to be involved. He loves that part of the game, which is you can be that person, and you can also do it with a bit of class. Was it needed? Yeah. Probably not. However... However, I'm going to back up Rico in this situation because those Irish came to my country. They came to my country and they said to our captain, Sam Kane, that you are a shit Richie McCaw. Not not even a year earlier than this World Cup. So Johnny Sexton was there as Omani went and screamed that at our captain's face and won 2-1, a series in New Zealand. And to follow up with that, Johnny Sexton, well known as a dickhead of rugby, banned because he shouted at a referee in a game he wasn't even playing in um, because they lost. So I kind of went, you know, this is dickhead against dickhead. Now, who is the least, least dickhead? I'm taking Rico. In any opportunity, I see Johnny Sexton's name down there. And I'm taking this Irish arrogance that they had all pre that World Cup. This wasn't an attack on Johnny Sexton from Rico. This was an attack on Irish rugby. And Johnny Sexton just happened to be the mantelpiece of Irish rugby at that time. And yeah. Rico said, you know what? Here's a knife. I'm going to stick it in. And you know what? I am not bothered by it. Win a quarterfinal, Johnny Sexton. No, you can't because you're retired. So bugger off into your retirement. Enjoy the book sales. And Rico will laugh and consider himself the joker. Yeah, look, for for my mind, I, I agree with your first point on this with the, you know, trash talk, keep it classy. That's rugby's way to do it, you know. And that's you, – you want the cleverness. You want the, the the banter part of it. And that's what, that's what makes great stories, you know. So – you know, if he just if he'd left off the swear word, I think it would it would have been a hundred percent behind Rico. If he just said, you know, enjoy the plane ride home. I hope you have a lovely retirement. It's great. Leave it at that. Don't add the cunt at the end or the old cunt. Just leave it. Leave it at that. And that's such a stinging burn. That that for me would irritate me more than if they called me a cunt at the end of it. Like you know, <laughs> enjoy the plane ride and enjoy your retirement. I'd be fucking burning at that. Whereas if he called me your cunt at the end, I I feel like I could just yell back something and call him a drug uh, well not drugs but like a, a not a, like a like swear at him back you know you give him that opening 
Um, but you know, you're right. No, there's no not really any sympathy to be had for for Sexton in this. Um, but yeah, let's let's keep rugby classy. You know, we just keep it. You know, uh, a thug's game played by a gentleman. You know, let's keep it. Let's keep it like that. Let's you know, there, so it's always uh, it's a. It's it's always much more satisfying when you when you outwit someone like that. So let's let's keep it classy, guys. You know, trash talk, yeah, but keep it classy. Classy, you know, James Bond rather than Austin Powers. Um, yes, we are three weekends away from some rugby, I believe. Actually, maybe even two weekends because I think the All Blacks play the Japan game pre the England game, so we might be two weekends away. From... There's some Wallabies XV action as well. Um, going, that's happening. I think that might be a little bit later on though. I know they got a game in England at some point as well. Um, we should we should say as well. Uh, in the World XV two, Wallaroos <laughs> champions. Two yeah, congratulations, second division. Yeah, yeah. Um... <laughs> we'll take it. Any champ, any title we can get, we will absolutely take that. What we're saying, any title we can get. <laughs> any, any wins a win. You know, like there, there's no no. Uh, there's no shame in that, you know. Like the 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 ladies played hard. We didn't play like it's not a terrible uh, second division. Scotland, Italy, South Africa, uh, Wales, and Japan. Like those are those are still decent teams. And where did you say, oh New Zealand finished fourth, one win. Hmm. Uh, that's oh that's where they finished in the table. Where did they finish overall? Do they get did they get into the finals? No, was there even finals? Yeah. I thought it was just a table. Might be. Well, you lost to England. It's just a table. Yeah, we lost to England. And do we do we lose to Canada in this one, or are we have we not played Canada yet? Uh, let's take a look here. Uh, New Zealand. You lost to Ireland. Yeah, we did do you that. Lost to England, and you beat France. Do we have a game against Canada? Um, no. Uh, no, no, you don't. Yeah, England were the champion. Yeah, it's just the table. So England won that. You came fourth. Australia won. That's right because we we didn't win the title. We just won our last game against Scotland. Um, but they it was basically the title game because Scotland was coming second. So um, oh yes, I see. Wait, there's, but there's no more games, is there? No. You just play three games no against games. different. Oh okay. yeah. Um, so yeah, look, look, yeah. Oh, congratulations. The, the XV three is awesome. Spain, Samoa, Netherlands, Fiji, Hong Kong, and Madagascar. Do you, that's and awesome that Madagascar's got the to total side for the Rugby World Cup. That's coming up. So I think it was Spain and Samoa. Correct me if I'm wrong. There's one and two. Uh, yeah, Spain and Samoa. So yeah, they both qualify yeah, for the uh, World Cup coming up next year. So yeah. um, that's in England. So we'll be right around that. But um, yeah, congratulations mm. on winning the second division. But yeah, mm, great. <laughs> it's, not, it's nice. To, it's nice to win win a, win a title. Win something. Yeah, you know? yeah. You have a trophy at least in the old um, photo you, op you, in the end of season photo. You, trophy. you got the bladders low, but I guess it doesn't really count as a trophy. <laughs> So yeah, um, look, Emily also <laughs> beats, you'll have some trophies, the Wallabies, because you beat Wales in the mid-year test, so you'll have a trophy yeah. for that, they'll, they'll have made a trophy for that. Um, look, we will be back again next week, um, same time, same place, ideally, I think the Wallaby squad will be named fully by then, um, so we'll cover that, so. I would be surprised if it's not, and then yeah, we'll be getting into some more rugby very soon. Thank you for joining us, I've been Luke, that has been Husey, this has been That Rugby Podcast, we will see you next time, goodbye. Peace.